ourselves. We will thank the Lord for the opportunity to meet again in the world. The Lord is gracious and he's been being helpful to us. We're looking at course 111, the kingdom. And brethren, in the last two lessons, we looked at uh, lesson seven and lesson eight. We looked at components and framework of the kingdom that in order to understand the kingdom, the Lord, it pleased him to lead us to see how certain key words and key themes and, you know, what you can call key components, they combine to make the kingdom complete. For instance, every kingdom must have a king who is a supreme ruler. And then in the kingdom, Yeshua HaMashiach is our king. And everything is for him. Everything is about him. And anything that is not for him, not about him, not from him, is suspect. Then every kingdom has a domain. Domain is the physical territory of the kingdom, the extent of the rule of the king, the territorial extent. And in the kingdom, the whole earth and the whole universe is the laws and the fullness thereof. And then beyond the domain, which has to do with the territory, we have number three, dominion. Dominion has to do with the extant authority of the king over the people. Those who are ruled by the king, they are his dominion. His dominion extends over them. And therefore, if somebody is a Christian but does not submit to the authority of the king, the person has denied himself the being part of the dominion of the king, though the person may be a believer. And that's why churchianity is very defective. It teaches you how to believe in Yeshua and then you live your life. Wait for the day you take it to heaven. But the Lord is asking us to know. He said, no, it's not just about Savior that will take you to heaven. He's king and Lord that will rule your life today. And by the grace of the Lord, we also looked at the fourth day qualifications for citizenship in lesson seven. That in the kingdom, the qualification is simple. The new birth experience. If any man is in Yeshua, is a new creature, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And it's very simple. If you believe in your heart, confess with your tongue that Yeshua came to, from heaven to earth to die for you and put your faith in him, you are saved. And with that, you become a citizen. Every kingdom, you have the true citizens. Then you have illegal aliens, you, you know, immigrants. You also have visitors. But citizens are the children of the kingdom. Then every kingdom also has ambassadors who represent the king in the court of other kings. They represent the kingdom in other kingdoms. And that's what the Lord wants us also to be. That we are not just kingdom citizens. We are not just kingdom citizens. We are not just the dominion of the Lord. He wants us to be open to walk in our ambassadorial you know, capacities, which the Lord has ordained us to represent him and declare the gospel of the kingdom so that those who are outside will know about the kingdom, will know about the king. And that's why we don't promote church. We don't promote other things. We promote the king. We promote the king and his kingdom. And then, you know, we looked also at yesterday, or rather the last lesson, we looked at constitution of the kingdom. That every kingdom has a constitution or a rule book that guides conduct of people, that talks about the authority of the king, the sphere of the king, the glory of the king, the honor of the king, and also what the people are expected, how they are expected to live, the principles that undergird their life. And in the kingdom, the constitution is the Holy Scriptures. The day you begin to look at the Holy Scriptures not as a religious book, which Christian religion encourages, but as a constitution, a legal document that determines all you do. The day you catch the concept of the Holy Scriptures as the constitution of the kingdom, it changes the dynamics. You know you have... You, you can't just try to game the system. You can't try to play God. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. And even in obeying him, are you obeying from the heart? Or is you doing it to please people? And then, of course, we looked at in the last lesson, which is lesson seven, the culture of the kingdom, the various aspects 
uh, and facets of the culture of the kingdom. And I want to thank the Lord for how he's leading us in this course so that we are giving ourselves some breathing space to reflect on the things that we are looking at. Today, we're going to go into some another set of components and I urge you to pay attention. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just look up to you. Without you, we can do nothing. Holy Spirit, just take over and guide our conversation today. Grant us more understanding of the kingdom. Let your name of the Father be glorified and Yeshua be exalted in our midst. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's now go to number eight of the components, and that is economic system. Every kingdom has an economic system. It is so important, and the system is based on the paradigm that is the operating system behind everything they've done in the kingdom. In a world, the operating system is lack. Lack. There is a lack operating system. And let me explain. In the world, the entire economic structure, it doesn't matter how you look at it, the theories of Adam Smith and other people, look at them, even to modern day pre, you know, economists like Krugman, it doesn't matter really what. They are basic, the basic thesis of economics is that population, human population is exploding. We're approaching 8 billion now. At the same time, resources available for, for the world is depleting. With climate change, is depleting faster. So what it means is that there's a scarcity paradigm, exploding population, depleting resources. So how do you manage it? It leads to a situation of conflict, a situation of competition, of strife. Who will get as much as possible so that you can take care of yourself, not just today, but tomorrow up to the day you die, and therefore generations to come, how do you make sure that they do not start life on the poverty lane? If possible, there's millions already out for them. So you see people do everything to get money. And that's why, for instance, capitalism it enables you to accumulate so generations to come. So that you give them an inheritance. And if you give people starvation wages today in order to stack up that one, it's all allowed. Brothers and sisters, in the kingdom, the principle is different. What is the principle? The kingdom principle of economics is this, that our Father in heaven, he created all. So if there are 8 billion, even if there are 10 billion, even if there are 20 billion people on earth, he has enough for every single one, enough to meet the need of everyone. And with that, we are no longer in the scarcity paradigm of managing competition and strife because he said in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according to as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us into his glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What is in the world is lost and lost in and lost in. In the kingdom, the needs of all of us, the Father knows. And he says, come. He is the multi-breasted one. He is El Shaddai. He can meet our needs. There is no need for competition. Your needs are different from the needs of the other person. And so that's why in the kingdom it tells us, Matthew 7, 7 to 11, Ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. He say, what father would not give his son what is asking him or give him something harmful, he said, no. So we have a father in heaven, Yahweh, who has all our needs. All we need is to come to him in the name of our king, Yeshua HaMashiach, and everything that is our need is provided. In the kingdom also, there are number nine instruments through which the kingdom operates. For instance, in the world, there is one of the instruments is currency. Every kingdom has a currency. The Americans have their dollar. The British have their pound. The Japanese have their yen. The Chinese have their renminbi. You know, the different currencies 
across Europe, all the 27 nations of Europe, you have the euro. So nations have currencies through which they do their economic system. In the kingdom, there are two principal currencies the Lord wants us to know. Number one is faith. Faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. And then Hebrews 11, 6 say, without faith, it is impossible to please Elohim. For he who comes to Elohim must believe that he is and is the reward of them that diligently seek him. So in the kingdom, the currency with which we trade is faith. Because by faith, we go to the throne of grace. By faith, we receive what we need from him. And when we back it up in prayer and faith, two sides of the same kingdom coin, you discover that there's nothing we cannot possess that is needful for us just by having faith and prayer. And also, revelation is the currency of the kingdom. It's not just enough to say faith. Faith in what? You have to have a revelation of something before you can have faith in it. So that's why a lot of people pray and nothing happens. Because they pray just, they take the dry words and hold it all over. They don't have a revelation of the word. Where you have faith in is where you have revelation of. If you have revelation of a scripture, of a something about Elohim, then your faith is easy to operate. And that is why faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. As you listen, your inner ear catches a revelation of something in the physical world. And when you combine them together, you're able to get everything you need from the Lord. Then, not just faith and revelation with prayer. 9.2 is that every kingdom has an educational system. The people of the world have an educational system. Communists have an educational system with socialists. You know, Liberal democracies have an economic system. Conservative uh, uh, societies have an educational system. If you go to America today, the educational system of conservative states is not the same as the liberal states. They are different. In the kingdom, we have an educational system. The educational system is about catching them young. You start everything about the education in the kingdom young. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. The way you train a child, watch that child, is going to get in substantially into the world through that way he's trained. And then, in Genesis 18, 19, Elohim said, I won't hide from Abraham what I'm about to do. I know Abraham. He will tell his children everything that I tell him. And in Proverbs Psalm 45 verse 7, we're told, Thou lovest righteousness, hated wickedness, therefore Elohim, thy Elohim, had anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. When children are re received fundamental basic training, and they are able to grow in it, you know what? It comes a time when they begin to love the Lord instinctively, especially when they now embrace the faith by themselves, not just when they were trained, when they were a child, when they grow up and exercise the faith in the Yeshua and receive the atoning work of the blood, they can grow to a place where they enjoy the favor of Elohim above their fellows. That's one of the things that happened to Daniel, Daniel 1.8. He proposed in his heart. He will not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. And for that reason, you see, that educational system that brought about that system of acknowledgement of Elohim in Daniel's life, the Lord exalted him above his fellows, and that was so. And so, brothers and sisters, in also concerning the systems of the kingdom, we see also Every kingdom has a healthcare system, 9.3. The healthcare system of the world, it offers citizens various ways to manage breakdowns of their health. Uh, you know, as people go about their business, you know, competing, striving, these things impact mental health, impacts emotional health, impacts physical health. But then, in the kingdom of Elohim, the healthcare system is based on principles in the world. One of them is wellness and wholeness. Wellness and wholeness. Just eating the right food. 
taking the right measure of drink, you know, like water, about eight liters or so daily, regularly, consistently, because the body is mainly water. Taking that and eating the right food and avoiding the foods that are not conducive to one's health, if you do that and exercise the physical body regularly, consistently, and you know what? Spare yourself having to worry, having to be anxious, trusting the Lord, being confident of the Lord, exercising hope in the Lord. You know what will happen? You're going to enjoy holistic well-being. Because the negative toxins that come about are releasing to the body by worry and anxiety, they are no longer there. And the systems function normally because you exercise them, because you take water, it flushes out, it supplies the kidney, it supplies the inward organs, and they are able to do what they ought to do. So the kingdom, you know, in the kingdom, the healthcare system starts from wellness and wholeness. As people learn the right ways to live and follow it and, and give it up, and then of course, if there's any breakdown, there's a promise of healing. First Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins shall live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. So the stripes that Yeshua suffered at the cross has paid the price for our healing if there's a breakdown. So if the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy, Yeshua comes that we must have life, have it more abundant. Remember, first, proactively, by the way we eat, when we drink, exercise ourselves, but even if there's a breakdown, he strives, we lay hold of it. So when a believer who is in a kingdom citizen, there's any issue, your first thought is not doctor. Your first thought is not medicine. Your first thought is the Lord. Your first thought is the power of his stripes. So you learn to pray about that and learn to receive that. And if there's an issue you can't handle, you call for the elders of the church. Many people don't know that these things are all conditions. You know? There are things you can handle alone. You pray, you receive. Suppose you pray. It didn't work. What do you do? James 5.13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over the him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed any sins it shall be forgiven him brothers and sisters I want to say something there it is important to know that brothers and sisters should be able to minister life to each other if somebody is going through a situation that is really serious while you are praying for that person it's also important to you know in, no, without being judgmental it's important to also See how you can take the person through prayer of repentance. Is it that some people offended you, you've not forgiven them? Is it that you have, you know, ought in your heart, all those things? You don't have to be judgmental to do that. You can just encourage them with the Holy Scriptures. The reason is this simple. Most sicknesses, you know, they, the doors are open through either bitterness, anger, offense, unforgiveness, all that. But beyond that also, remember about eternity. So it makes sense to try to lead people to make contacts with the Lord, to take away anything that may have come upon them they may not know. Then, number 10, there are sundry dis disciplines of kingdom life, just as in the world. They have a whole lot of disciplines and you know sundry regulations. Let's take a few of these things. Number one. Personal responsibility. In the kingdom, those who are kingdom citizens, they take personal responsibility. They know that, yes, Elohim loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. He wants everybody to be saved. But those who do not respond, they don't get saved. So even though you're a child of God now, you know you don't just, oh, because I'm a child of God, you're careless, you do whatever. No, you take personal responsibility. That responsibility is actually what makes you, if you go outside God's way, in any shape or form, you take responsibility to own it up and to tell the Lord, I'm sorry. 
and the Lord forgive me. And the Lord will forgive you. Taking personal responsibility is a sign of one growing in the kingdom. It is very important. Take personal responsibility. There are things the Lord expects us to be able to do by his grace at work in us. But when we don't respond to that grace at work in us, we just delay our work with him. The second one is personal discipline and moderation. You know, the Lord expects us to be people who are moderate in what we do, in eating, in drinking, in everything. It's not because you have money. The Bible says you found honey. Don't eat too much because while honey is good, you eat too much, it can give you a runny stomach. So we exercise moderation. In Philippians 4, 5, the Bible says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful. A certain age, you could eat three eggs. When you grow older, three eggs will destroy you. They won't build you up. So you be careful how you, you know you go in. You know how what you put inside of you. Check up what you do. You know moderation. Be moderate in all things. Then three ten point three order. The kingdom is an ordered kingdom. Kingdom citizens, they grow in grace, they walk in order, they gladly learn how to align wherever they are. You take note of which authority has the Lord planted, who is the legitimate authority the Lord has planted. You walk in alignment. It's very important. I think it was Watchman Nee that first made that statement when he wrote on authority that how do you know spiritual people? They don't struggle with authority. They know how to align with authority. You know, an authority is not oppressive. No, you don't need to. The enemy is he who injects into human beings that authority is oppressive. That's what happened to Adam. When Adam sinned, he ran away from the presence of Elohim. No, there's order in the kingdom. And that order makes you to align properly. We are told in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, 38, all these men of war, who could keep rank? Who could keep rank? They came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. Take note of that. They could keep rank. You know you are a captain. You know where you are relative to a lieutenant colonel, a colonel, a brigadier, a general, a three-star general or four-star general or a full general or a field marshal. You also know where you are relative to a sergeant and a corporal. So that is what it means to keep rank. Spiritual people, they know how to keep rank. You know the grace of the Lord upon your life. You know what is also upon other people. And you know who the Lord has connected you with. And you give them their honor due to them, their respect due to them. You take instructions and you do your bit. And there's no struggle. That's for same principle in Joel chapter 2. That people don't, they don't trust at each other. They know how to keep ranks. You stay in the order. The kingdom is an ordered one. Then 10.4 you see that simplicity is also part of the kingdom. When you are truly in the kingdom, you are not complex. You are not complicated. You are simple. You are simple. And if you are in leadership, people have access to you. Every brother, every sister that is part of the people you are leading can assess you because the kingdom is simple. Yeshua HaMashiach. The night they came to arrest him, you know what? They didn't know whether it was James or John or Peter. They had to hire Judas Iscariot, pay him, offer him a good sum of money in those days for him to betray Yeshua among 12 people. Can you imagine that? Because it was simple. It was not complicated. All these things, people now want to wear robes and caps and staff of office and all that and sit on thrones. It is not kingdom. And that's why religion fosters those things. In the kingdom, you must willingly let go of everything that fluffs you off so you can be able to relate with others with simplicity. Also, 10.5, in the kingdom, we have kingdom communities. That's what local assemblies should be. That's actually the real, the real concept of local assemblies. It's not as church that is competing with others. No, it's as kingdom communities the Lord connects you with. And where he connects you with, he says in Hebrews 10, 25, 
not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. So you, there are people the Lord wants to connect you with and you find your place there. How do you know? You find yourself at peace. You find there's no crisis in you. You find a connection. You find that you can release things, they receive it. They release things, you receive it. And that is the right way to know where the Lord has connected you. And part of the problem people have is that they are actually going to get local assemblies the way they want. And that is cause all the problem. Because at times the expectations are not met. They get angry, they get offended, they begin to speak evil. Otherwise, if you are open, the Lord knows who he connects you with. He knows the leader, the particular shepherd he has given to you. So you don't even need to look at that shepherd or that shepherd. The one the Lord gave to you, the food from that person will truly satisfy you. So the kingdom has communities where saints are connected and aligned. Let me take the, this one before we go. We're going to have another uh, edition of this. You know, we, we'll have the fourth one, the fourth part to enable us get it all. Number 11. Every kingdom has military resources and capacity. You see, the military resources are for two purposes. One, to protect them against external aggression. Number two, if the king has expansionist ambitions, the soldiers go do the work. And so in the kingdom of Elohim, we also have you know, capacity for defense and capacity for expansion of the kingdom. That's what prayer does. Prayer is one of the means of that. That's also fasting. He told us in Matthew 17, you know, this type goeth not up, but with prayer and fasting. There are certain things we meet that require us to discipline the body, put the body under subjection, so that the spirit man is liberated to operate beyond the physical realm and begin to be more able to exercise faith in what the Lord says. That's also a tool in our military of the, in the military dimension of the kingdom. Then, of course, we are told about spiritual warfare in 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking out about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is walking around seeking whom he may devour. Then he says, verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith, resist him steadfast in the faith with militancy in the spirit, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brain that is in the world. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul the Apostle now tells us, finally, from verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's where we are. That's our militancy is in the Lord. It's not, it's not flesh and blood. That's why he said, Verse 11, put on the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All his attacks say put on the whole armor. And then what are the armor? They say why the armor? Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not something you can see. It's not human beings. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places, they are there. There is no uncontested space. There is no empty space in the spiritual realm. Every space is occupied. And so whether it's the office, whether your neighborhood, whether anywhere around you, there are powers of darkness, forces of darkness. You may not see them, but they are there nevertheless. And if you give them a chance, they want to on behalf of Satan, steal, kill, destroy. On behalf of Satan, keep people miserable. On behalf of Satan, take away your peace, take away your joy, take away the right standing, the, you, the, the sense of righteousness you have. And therefore, the Bible says we must push back. We must push back. We must push back the frontier of darkness and the tools are there. And it talks about the armor, wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of Elohim. Then he begins to tell us the belt of truth, holding all the uh, all that you are wearing in the downside and all you are wearing in the upside. Let truth be the remit of your life. Let truth hold you together. Live within the ambit of truth, not outside truth. Live a life that is true, not false, not fake. Let truth undergird you. 
Then it talks about the breastplate of righteousness because this segment is very, very, very sensitive. Any arrow, any bullet that pierces through one is gone. You know what? So take the breastplate of righteousness, iron plates, you know, they are worn to, to, to make sure that anything coming does not get at the target. Then it talks about having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Be ever ready to be an instrument of expansion of the kingdom because in spiritual warfare, you are pushing back, you are taking territory, you are taking prisoners and making sure that they come to the knowledge of Elohim. Then you have, you know what, the shield of faith that protects you as the arrows are flying all over, you are protecting yourself and then you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim for offensive declaration, even defensive also, Yeshua. All his time Satan came against him, what was Yeshua's response? It is written. Again, it is written. You know, you know I'm now in the book of Psalms. I've read the New Testament. I've read from Genesis. Now in the book of Psalms, almost getting to the end of it. You know, every aspect of scripture, I see powerful scriptures that the Lord has kept for his people. But because God's people are so empty, they go and fill themselves with worldly concepts. They don't know that everything that pertains to life and godliness is given. We have the capacity to war. They say, take the helmet of salvation. Before you can see any sin, you literally took your helmet out. Wear it always. Protect your mind. Protect your, you, your that sensitive part because just as the heart, if it pierces through, a bullet pierces through it, it's gone. An arrow is gone. So also the brain. If a bullet pierces through the brain, it's gone. So he said, we are the helmet of salvation always. The Lord wants us to be people who are always, not sometimes, always protected always with the whole armor and always militant in the spirit. Remember, it's not against flesh and blood that we're fighting. So we are looking at the unseen spirits at work. The deviations you see in character of people, don't use your tongue to stoke strife. Stay in the place of prayer. Stay in the place of warfare and deal with the spirits at work. And you're going to see things happen. In your business, did you know that if you invest 30 minutes of warfare each day, your day is made. You just go to pick up the spoils. Brothers and sisters, you know, some people think, we're, we're not just full-time preachers today. I was in business. I mean, as a matter of fact, I have a paid degree of business. My late father was a businessman. And then I grew into business early, very early. It wasn't only that, okay, study, you know, some, you know, business and all that, but also early, right from when I went to do industrial practice, you know what? And I eventually inherited that because the owner moved on and left it all to me and I began to build it. I was able to build it into, I don't need to mention the figures, and nobody think into of us, but we built it up big, green, big time. Brothers and sisters, and I know that the time we spent from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. in prayer and warfare made the work easier. Working in extreme favor. Do you know every business meeting you are going to should have been preceded with serious warfare? That you can lay hold of the mind, the heart, the will of the people and declare the ordinance of the Lord that he who is spiritual judges all things but is judge of no man. It is that you can lay hold of that scripture in First uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 12, that you who are spiritual will judge all things and nobody will seek to judge you apart from your Father in heaven. And if we are not militant, we become toast to the world. If we are not militant, we walk in lack and squeeze. The spiritual realm is real. Business, most of the times you are dealing with Asian demons that have rested in certain families, covenants they made with Satan, and they have walked in it, and they guard their businesses, that nobody will come into it. And here is you, a believer. You want to just walk in? No. You break through. You can set aside. You can nullify every rampant that is built against you. And your territory, you can possess it. 
Yes, by prayer, you can pray like Jabez. Oh Lord, enlarge my coast. And the Lord will enlarge it. You can also, as Holy Spirit prompts you, you can take away every barrier and break every glass ceiling because you are, put, you are ordained to be on top and not below. The head and not the tail. The Lord didn't put you to business to scrounge around and, and take the leftover. No. He who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the industry he has taken you to, you are ordained to be a leader, to be the light, to offer the way forward. And the Lord is more than pleased to open the doors of favor for you, to clothe you with favor like a shield. Soak yourself in his presence and these things will come to pass. So the kingdom is complete in itself. Tomorrow we'll look at another dimension and we'll see what the Lord has to tell us. So by way of assignment, can you summarize what we've learned concerning, you know, uh, lesson eight, the and all the way to lesson 11, I mean, point eight to 11, and the sub uh, divisions thereof, can you give us summaries? And then two, please, can you share with us, you know, how this lesson, in what way is challenged you, or you've learned something very useful. Tomorrow we round up this section, that we go into deeper waters of kingdom truth. We love you dearly, and we pray the Lord will visit you and grant you understanding and your life will never be the same. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because you are truly gracious. What you are releasing to us, we just say, have your way. And give us the grace to download it all into our spirit, man, and walk in the truth that your name may be honored and glorified. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayer. And thank you for Pastor Grace on the camera. Let your name be glorified. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen.